hundreds of items are in this report. They tell the complete story of a counterintelligence survey at Fort Bradley, New York, representing more than a month of work by the Intelligence Corps. It covers information security, personnel security, physical security. Now in the hands of the region commander of the Intelligence Corps, the report is ready to serve a vital purpose, to help Fort Bradley's commander determine what measures he needs to protect his installation against espionage, sabotage, and subversion. Part one of this counterintelligence survey left the team of three INTC special agents as they were beginning the preliminary tour of Fort Bradley. Accompanied by an escort from the Installation Intelligence Office, such a tour not only gives the team a chance to get briefly acquainted with the installation, but more important, it designates the sensitive areas. Since the compilation and editing of this report were done by the special agent in charge, we will turn the telling of the second part of the counterintelligence survey story over to him. Well, to begin with, Bradley's history could fill a book. It went back to 1741. Indians, Revolutionary War, and all of that. Part of our job was to dig into this historical background. Some of it could easily affect Bradley's security. How? Well, take an old battery like the one at Fort Bradley. Sometimes you'd find a tunnel running from the casements to the arsenal. A tunnel that could well be used by hostile agents. Our escort confirmed the fact. There was such a tunnel, but its entrances are now covered by metal fencing material. I made a note to also ask the post engineer about it. Fort Bradley used to be one of the main defenses of New York Harbor, but that's history. At the time of our survey, there seemed to be little, if any, coastal protection. Some portions of the Bay Area were properly fenced. But most of it was wide open. Small boats could land and discharge persons directly into the reservation. Swimmers could come ashore. There was no point in commenting about it to our escort, since this was just an orientation tour. Driving on, we came to some buildings used for sensitive ordnance material. How secure they were, we couldn't tell at this time. But judging from the properly fenced-in transformer located in the same area, it seemed that security was certainly not being ignored. A little further on, we came to a bowling alley. A good morale factor. It goes without saying, higher the morale, less opportunity for subversion. But what was this? A railroad track cutting right through the heart of the installation. A private railroad, according to our escort. My question was, couldn't someone, a hostile agent, enter Bradley via this railroad unnoticed? Something else for us to look into later on. So far, I thought Bradley was definitely a security-conscious installation. But it didn't have tight security. Driving along the southern boundary, we saw excellent fencing, the best. Strange, isn't it? A good protective fence. Yet back there, a few moments ago, apparently no protection against an open coastal area and a private railroad running right through the installation. That's the way it goes. A counterintelligence survey reveals many contradictions. Now to tour the outside of the installation. We saw nothing that looked as though it could affect the security of the installation, just some industrial buildings quietly engaged in turning out food products. Soon we came to a warehouse. Why should a warehouse interest us? Very simple. Suppose it contained explosives or something highly combustible or inflammable. A saboteur wouldn't have to go inside Fort Bradley to do his dirty work. He could make the warehouse his target. But this warehouse, we were told, was only a storage place for a wholesale grocery.
Well, that'll give you an idea of what a survey team might find on an orientation tour of an installation. It was time now to look into Bradley's security needs at closer range. Since the extent of an installation's security requirements depended on its mission, our next move took us to the office of the installation intelligence officer. Bradley's mission. Here you are. To provide field maintenance, logistical support, and technical assistance for all missile units in the area. It's all yours. What else? Based on this mission, how important would you say Bradley is? Bradley's importance? Big question. Well, you see, Major Harding, our evaluation of Bradley's security depends on how vital the installation is. For example, what would happen if the installation were uh, destroyed or neutralized? How would it affect our military capabilities? Well, if this post were destroyed or neutralized, it'd be a big loss. A loss not only as far as trained personnel is concerned, or cost of equipment, but the chain of supply and maintenance in certain vital military areas. Couldn't other installations nearby take over? Could, but uh, take a look at this. Now, uh, let's say Fort Pershing took over. To supply its vital military customers, Pershing would have to contend with routes of travel through heavily congested communities, a complex of bridges and vehicular tunnels. It'd take hours, days. Now, Bradley is a vital link in our chain of defense. All of which told us that Fort Bradley had better have good, tight security. Yes, the more important the installation, the more protection it needs. From this point on, our job became a minute inspection of the installation. For this, we needed blueprints. And for blueprints, we went to the post engineer. Can you read blueprints? As part of our job, we're not experts. We'll be needing your help from time to time, Major. Well, just say the word. Well, now, let's take a look. Now, these are the temporary buildings. T-103, 106, 7, 8, and nine. Over here are the permanent buildings, 21, 22, and 30. These are sensitive areas. This is Bradley's original boundary where the railroad is now. Oh, Major, that railroad. Does the installation have any control over the trains passing through? Not very much. You see, the railroad company owns the right-of-way. Of course, the Provo Marshal keeps a pretty sharp eye on it. Trouble is, legally, we can't get rid of it, and we need all of the area on both sides of the track especially with this uh, ordinance expansion program. Sometimes you've got to make the glove fit the hand. Uh, excuse me. Sure. I didn't say so, but I thought to myself, a tight glove can cramp your fingers, sometimes stop the blood circulation. But such things, for diplomatic reasons, you keep to yourself. Make a mental note. Add it to your yardstick in measuring an installation security requirements. Fencing and bridging might be costly, but worth it. Now, is there anything else I can do for you? Well, Major, can you furnish us with blueprints on water, power supply? Yes. One other thing. Do you got anything on hidden tunnels? Oh, you mean the hidden tunnel over at the old battery? We heard there was one. Yes, it runs from the gun emplacements uh, to the arsenal. In fact, there's a branch that opens on Bearskin Bluff. We'd like to take a look at it. Well, just let me know whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, Major. Now, in the meantime, if you can give it... With blueprints to guide us, Bradley's mission always in the back of our minds, we got started on physical security. Fences, gates, more fences, more gates. During those first few days, we saw dozens of them. Our photographic record was beginning to tell the story of a counterintelligence survey. Al, our photographer, the youngest member of the team, was piling up experience as quickly as he was piling up still shots of Fort Bradley. Paul, our authority on security regulations, kept adding to the checklist. The fact that Fort Bradley was considered such an important installation increased our workload. Sometimes we operated together, sometimes separately. And that way, we were able to cover a lot of ground. Good examples of security and exceptions. 
To a great extent, military installations are like human beings. They have their good points and weaknesses. Take some of those fences and gates we inspected. There was the eight-foot cyclone chain link fence with an 18-inch, three-strand barbed wire overhang, extending outward. One of the best. Then there was a gate. Enough ground had washed away from under the one corner of the gate to allow a thin person to slide under when it was closed. Another good fence, but a security weakness had occurred. Thick shrubbery could not only obscure a hostile agent's movements, but could help him climb over without any difficulty. These are fine, Al. You know, I'd like to get some shots inside the tunnel. When the survey's finished. Mm. I have an appointment with the Provo Marshal. Oh, Paul, I'll go over these checklists with you later, all right? To examine the guard system and to discuss items that had been noted, the Provo Marshal made the rounds with me. Just to give you an idea, tight security was practiced at both the main and rear gates. Everything according to established procedures. This included proper identification procedures and vehicular control. If someone had an improper identification or no identification at all, the guard would first telephone the person or office to be visited to determine if the visitor was expected. If he was expected, he'd be given a visitor's slip to be signed by the person visited. The slip giving time of arrival and departure would then be returned to the guard. If one could judge an installation security by an efficient guard system, I'd say Bradley had nothing to worry about in keeping undesirables out. But there was more, much more to be considered. A big item was crime. Any cases of vandalism or narcotics? Narcotics? As for vandalism, well, about a month ago we thought we had something. One day we'd find a large swastika scrawled all over the front of the building. Another day it was a hammer and sickle. Fluctuated that way. Had us going for a while. Battling Nazism one day and communism the next. But it was all the work of a psycho. Out of the army by now. It's all here in this report. Take along with you. How about homosexuals? To the best of our knowledge, none. Vandalism, a high crime rate, personnel with abnormal habits, these factors must be considered. Their presence can form a weak link in any security chain. A vital link in any installation security chain is its firefighting capabilities. The capacity to safeguard material needed for our defense. But Bradley's equipment was suitable only for fighting the ordinary kind of fire, like house fires. This condition, I felt, should be brought to the immediate attention of the installation intelligence officer. Not enough equipment? Well, plenty of equipment, Major. It's not the right kind. Bradley is now dealing with electronics and modern fuels. Let a fire break out and... We've had it. I'm afraid so, Major. Bradley's mission is practically begging for a new fire truck. The most up-to-date model you can get. Well, that's a costly item, a new truck. But the material moving in here is even more costly. We don't like to be unreasonable with our recommendations, Major. No, 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 you're doing okay. Keep going. The budget's our problem. An on-the-spot recommendation. A chance for the commander to correct the fault before it showed up in our counterintelligence survey report. According to our checklist, we were covering a lot of ground. Our photographic exhibits were piling up. Like the other batch of stills, the latest one showed examples of some security problems still to be resolved. There were buildings with good protective lighting and buildings which for their new use needed better equipment. My boys were doing a good job. They examined fire escapes, power lines, drain pipes. They went in and out of places like moles. 
examining full ceilings. Underground areas where a saboteur or an espionage agent could operate with access and escape through unprotected gratings. Yes, we had covered a lot of ground. Of course, the things you've been told here are just some of the highlights. It'll take hours for the whole story. With the 25th of October as our deadline, we had a little more than two weeks of survey left. Sometimes you look, as I so often do, at the large numbers of people who enter and leave a military installation every day, and you wonder, how can you tell if they're loyal? Loyal to their work, loyal to the United States. Here is the most valuable element in our security, people. Everything looks right, security-wise. They show their ID cards, their badges. But it's not enough just to identify yourself. For each person has a private life. It was part of our business as counterintelligence survey agents to get as closely as possible to this private life. That's how George Milner, telephone maintenance man, became involved in the counterintelligence survey. It happened during my inspection of the post signal office. A quiet fellow, Milner. No one could tell by talking to him or looking at him whether or not he was loyal to the United States. Yet, he was in a position at a critical time, a time of alert, to sabotage Bradley's communication system. Its telephone system knocked out. Bradley could become dangerously isolated. Conduct a few counterintelligence surveys and soon your security yard stick will work automatically. I was suddenly reminded of something that happened in Germany. It had to do with the telephone maintenance man at one of our military installations. Herr Gustav Herrmann, excellent technician, a Gemutlich fellow, family man, and pro-American. So we would have you believe. Then came a counterintelligence survey, a spot check of personnel, followed by a check with central counterintelligence files. And ever faithful Gustav turned out to be an accomplice of a hostile agent. What about Milner? Couldn't he be another Gustav Herrmann? Then I thought, did Milner have a certificate of clearance? Was one required for him at Bradley? To determine this, I got hold of a clearance roster from the IIO. Milner's name was not included. To be sure that Milner's name was not left off the roster by mistake, I checked his personnel file in the Office of Civilian Personnel. If Milner had a valid DA Form 873, that is, a certificate of clearance, then the roster would be in error. No certificate of clearance. Right then and there, I made a note to recommend that a proper security clearance be required for Milner's job. Not to hurt anyone's livelihood or discredit his loyalty, our aim at all times is to provide proper security based on the importance of Bradley's mission. By this time, we were well into our inspection of personnel security. Using the clearance roster as a guide, we spot checked about 20% of the civilian personnel folders. In each case, roster personnel had a valid DA Form 873, Certificate of Clearance showing to what category of classified material a person was authorized access. In each case, there was a valid DD Form 1111, certificate of non-affiliation with certain organizations, which indicates whether an individual has been affiliated with a subversive organization. Whenever there is an 873, you should always find a 1111. That's the way it works. In the military personnel office, we spot checked about 20% of the enlisted men and 20% of the officers. Yes, it was necessary for us to get as closely as possible to the private lives of those who hold down sensitive positions. As for security of information, our inspection showed a healthy regard for regulations. Take incoming classified mail. All incoming classified mail was handled by a control clerk. Proper procedures were being followed in receiving, 
examining, opening, and logging documents received. Appropriate entries were then made on the mail and document register, DA Form 455. In Fort Bradley's classified library, there was further evidence of good security. First, the name of anyone requesting classified information was checked against the clearance roster. Before a person could remove classified information, a temporary receipt had to be signed. DA Form 1203. The receipt would be held until the proper return of the document. That sergeant knew AR 380 5 like he knew his serial number. Of no less importance than a security conscious worker is a good container for storing classified defense information. Bradley had such containers, the four drawer variety, built of steel, with a Group 1 built in three position dial type combination lock meeting military and federal specifications. We found these containers in every sensitive area. Each container carried a DA Form 727, showing the number of the safe and the date on which the combination was last changed, and the names, addresses, and home telephone numbers of persons being responsible for the container. Well, once again, that'll give you an idea of the hundreds of items we covered in the past three weeks. Our inspections, photographs, interviews had fully covered the essentials of physical security, security of personnel, security of information. We'd reached the end of a minute counterintelligence survey of Fort Bradley, and it looked as though we were going to meet our deadline. What else was there to do? That telephone call gave us the answer. It was from the office of Fort Bradley's commander. The commander and the IIO were ready to meet with us for a final briefing. This is, has to be corrected, I know that. Now we're happy to report, sir, that Bradley's present security measures are not far afield from his counterintelligence needs. Well, that's good to hear. But before I continue, sir, I'd like to say on behalf of my team that we received the greatest cooperation wherever we went, sir. Thank you. There's one point I'd like to emphasize that has to do with our recommendations. They're not to be considered as absolute. We realize that you here at Fort Bradley, as well as at other installations, do have budgetary problems. Well, uh, that's true. And I'm very glad to hear that you realize that. So if any of our recommendations would take too big a slice out of your budget, sir, please tell us and we'll try to make other recommendations. Well, that will do. Now, in that regard, uh, you mentioned something about perimeter fencing. Well, sir, if perimeter fencing would prove too costly a proposition, you might concentrate on just fencing the sensitive areas and still maintain proper security. Fine. That'll be a big help. Now, we've already made several on-the-spot recommendations, sir. For example, we've recommended a new fire truck, the most up-to-date kind, the kind that can fight fires involving electronics and fuel. But if that's too costly, you can compensate by installing more hand-type extinguishers and other firefighting means. Now, that won't be necessary, Mr. Francis. We've already received approval for a new fire truck. Very good, sir. Now, what about personnel security? On the matter of personnel security, we're recommending security clearances for some of your people. Uh, here's a list of them, sir, along with the reasons for such clearances. Well, thank you. Now, you take care of these. Speaking of personnel, sir, we were very impressed with your security education program, the use of films, lectures, things like that. Oh, yes, sir. The tunnel at the old battery, we're going to recommend that it be blocked up completely. Of course, all our recommendations, including the entire survey, will be in our written report. About uh, how soon can I expect to receive this report? Well, I should think about two or three weeks, sir. This report, the counterintelligence survey report, was written and put together back at our field office. It was a detailed, concise resume of our findings, complete with photographs, maps, and blueprints to support these findings. On 20 November, six weeks after we had been assigned to the job, the INTC region commander had the report. And a monumental job it is, to say nothing of its importance to our national security. Now to get it to the commander at Fort Bradley. 
Forwarded to group headquarters, the report accompanied by a cover letter is sent to the Assistant Chief of Staff, G2, 1st Army. After receiving an endorsement at 1st Army headquarters, the report finally reaches a commander at Fort Bradley. Yes, here is where it all began. By request of the commander, a counterintelligence survey has been made to determine the security needs of Fort Bradley. A factual guide is now available to help the commander protect his installation against espionage, sabotage, and subversion. Thank you.